morning's sermon is titled, Don't Self-Destruct. And we're looking at step one. Step one, tell us. Huh? <coughs> Anybody want to recite it? We are powerless over our addiction. Our lives have become a myth. Mm. We recognize. Right? We come to our senses, I guess, and we recognize that our lives are unmanageable. And I always laugh about that word, like that word, unmanageable. Because it was a lot more than just being unmanageable. I'm sure we're crazy. You're like madmen. But we are unmanageable to the extent that we're not able to manage ourselves back into normalcy, I'd say. So that's what we want to look at this morning, right? Step one, right? We admit. We admit that we are powerless. We are not in a position where we ourselves, in our own understanding and in our own strength, we are not able to get ourselves well. Or you wouldn't be here if you were. I mean, we try, right? Anybody else try? You know, and, and we really wanted to stop being that person. We really wanted to be better, but we weren't able to do it on our own. So we have to admit that we're just powerless over our addiction. There's a lot to that. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for being here with us. Father, help me this morning. You know I'm sick, and we're all sick. Many of us here in the chapel this morning are sick physically from uh, cold. We have a cold. Sometimes that makes our brains a little foggy. Clear my mind, Lord. Clear my mind so that you might speak to me. Help me, Lord. Speak through me the words that you would have us to know. There's a whole lot of scripture here that we're looking at, but it's a simple message. One that we should know. But it's hard, Father. <clears throat> Because you're going to tell us about stop doing, we're going to be told to stop doing things that we might like, but they're harmful. So help us, Lord, this morning to make real decisions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so. We're powerless, right? If we, if we don't admit our powerlessness, then we really can't even get started. You know, if we say that we're really only here because, you know, the, the legal system tells us we have to do a program, or we're only really here so that our wives will, or our girlfriends will let us back in the house, or our parents, or whatever that might be, you haven't even gotten here yet. You haven't even admitted yet that you are powerless over the things that caused you to need this place. Our lives become unmanageable, and we're not able to straighten that out on our own. We can't make ourselves feel well without help. We couldn't manage our illness. Again, so we admit that we need help. We cry out to God. And God puts us on a path. So here we are. This surrender of control, admittance of powerlessness is not as simple as the initial experience. See, because once we've made that initial admittance that we need help, but we can't do this on our own. God puts us on a path, and then he starts pointing out to us behaviors 
that go well beyond putting a substance in our body. We have to be honest about that. We have to look at that. We have to see all these other things as part of our active addiction, and we're carrying them over as we're trying to get clean. It goes much deeper. Our lives are full of thoughts, feelings, emotions, desires, lusts, wants, shortcomings, and sickness that we are powerless over. And we have to be honest with ourselves about that. There are many things in each one of our lives that could tear us down if we still try to control them on our own. It requires total surrender of self. And, and again, that initial surrender of self is, is necessary. It's a requirement. But it also then requires us each day, as we feel tempted to give in to a behavior that was part of our old self, Right? To let go of that, to surrender that to God. To lay that at his feet and say, please, Lord, first, thank you for pointing this out. Now take it from me because I don't want to be that old person. Because if we continue doing these things that are all part of our old self, relapse is only a few steps away, maybe one step away. We've already started on that relapse. So we have to continue as God points out to us the things that need to be removed. But you're not alone. Every person on earth suffers <coughs> to some extent or another. And we find references to people such as this in the Bible. And Samson was definitely one of these people that dealt with temptation. That dealt with lusts, wants, desires that were not in line with God's will for his life. And what happened? So Samson was powerless over something many of us can relate to, wasn't he? <laughs> All right. So here we go. Samson and the lie. What's, what, what page is this little thing about Samson and Delilah? Here it is. In your life recovery Bibles. The New Testament describes Samson as a man of faith. Okay, so he's a man of faith. It mentions neither his, his failures or his great, nor his great strength. Though he possessed great physical strength. He was a moral weakling. Following to his own selfish desires and ignoring God. Samson spent most of his life pursuing his own goals. But in the end, he finally admitted his need and cried out to God for help. Okay? So he was a strong man. And we see that in his life, right? Yet the whole story is about his strength and where he got his strength from. But yet it says that he was a moral weakling. So he was lacking in something. Right? His desires for things that were other than that which God would have for him is what took him down. It's what takes us down when we give in to those lusts. It seems that after the first three episodes of betrayal, Samson would have known not to trust Delilah. But like many of us, Samson thought that giving in to manipulation was an expression of love. He chose to please Delilah and get what he wanted from her rather than obey God and deliver his people. Delilah chose to use her relationship with Samson for her own gain. It was clearly a dysfunctional relationship. Most of us have experienced the pain of being used, and we have undoubtedly used others. We have known the agony of being betrayed. It will do no good to look at Samson and think about what he did, what he did not accomplish. We are often victimized in our own life by thoughts of what might have been. Samson shows us that as long as we have life, we have hope. You hear that? As long as we have life, we have hope. It's never too late. 
to turn our life over to God and allow Him to redeem us and restore what, he has, what we have been lost. <coughs> In spite of his failure, Samson was li is listed as a champion of faith in Hebrews 11. Right? Can we hear that in our call of worship? A little bit of it? In spite of our failures, we too can be champions of faith as God continues to work out recovery in our life. So there's the whole story, right? <clears throat> In order to succeed, Samson had to surrender himself to God. Sixteen. One. One day Samson went to Philistine town of Gaza. He spent the night with a prostitute. Word soon spread that Samson was there. So the men of Gaza gathered together and waited all night at the town gates. They kept quiet during the night, saying to themselves, when the light of morning comes, we will kill him. But Samson stayed in bed only until midnight. Then he got up, took hold of the doors of the town gate, including two posts, and lifted them up, bar and all. He put them on his shoulders and carried them all the way to the top of the hill across from Hebron. All right, so what do we get out of that? <coughs> Down sleeping around and getting across the Four or five. So Delilah's, oh wait, where am I at? Sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah, who lived in a village of Sora. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, Entice Samson to tell you what makes him so strong and how he can overpower and tie, up, tie him up securely. Then each of us will give you a thousand, oh, 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah says to Sam, please tell me. Please tell me. Okay. So here we got a guy that has an issue with women. Okay? So he wants what he wants. So he's going to he's going to do what he has to do to get what he wants. Even, right, and we're going to read into this, even knowing that this woman is there. That she's out to get him. So this whole dysfunctional relationship, really all they're doing, it's two people in a relationship to get what they want. You ever been in a relationship like that? Some of you might be. And we tell ourselves, well, I don't care if she's using me, I'm using her. Is that fun? Is, is that, right? It's dysfunctional. Is, is that something that we can say, well, you know, <laughs> at least I'm not using her. Is that something we could try to tell ourselves, well, you know, it's okay? <laughs> because that's what we tell ourselves, so at least I'm not using it. Is that something that we can go before God and expect God to bless us in our recovery, knowing that we're doing things that are definitely wrong in His eyes? It's dysfunctional. It's part of our old sickness. But yet you're still living in it. Okay, so he hooks up with Delilah, but she's in a relationship for the wrong reasons, right? It's dysfunctional. The sick part is that he knows she's evil, but he don't seem to care because there's something else he cares about. Can you relate to that? Where am I at? Six? Again, so Delilah says, please tell me what makes you so strong. <clears throat> what, and, 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 I mean, and she even comes right out and says, what would it take for me to tie you up securely? <clears throat> Samson replied, if I were tied up with seven new bowstrings that have not yet been dried, 
I would become as weak as anyone else. So the Philistine rulers thought Delilah seven, got her seven new bowstrings and she tied up Samson with them. She had hidden some men in, in, in one of her inner rooms. And, okay, so here she is. She sets him up. I'm not going to read this whole thing. You can read it for yourself. She sets him up. He tells her to lie about what he'll do just so he can get what he wants. And, and yet, he continues the relationship just so he can get what he wants while she's trying to get what she wants. So Delilah continues to nag him over and over and over. And Samson keeps lying to her over and over and over. But she's wearing him out. She's wearing him out. 15. What am I at here? Then Delilah pouted after this nagging back and forth. How can you tell me you love me when you don't share your secrets with me? You've made fun of me three times now, and you still haven't told me what makes you strong. She tormented him with her name. All right, listen. I don't want to think too much about my past, but. <laughs> she tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. Finally, Samson shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut, he confessed. For I was, I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. All right, so let's even get away from the women part of this. <coughs> let's look at this as temptation of anything that we know is wrong in God's eyes. Let's look at this as uh, a bottle of vodka for some, a bag of dope for others, a couple caps of crack for some, whatever that might be. Okay, so that's the substance. But how about stuff? Let's look at this as, well, so-and-so has got so many good things and I don't have any of them and I'm going to keep looking at them until what happens? I take them. I'm going to think about that bottle of vodka enough without sharing with somebody else that I'm thinking about it, before I do what? Yeah. See, temptation nags at us. <coughs> temptation nags at us. We know it is wrong. We know it is wrong. Whatever that is that's nagging at us. But we sit there and we argue with it. We try to take on that strength by ourselves. Right? That temptation. We try to so we try to handle it with our own strength. And it nags at us until we give in to it. That's what we need to look at. Okay? For some it might be women, but it's not for everybody. Okay? It can be anything that nags at us over and over again. And we think about it and we think about it. It might not be something coming out with words and saying, look, you gotta do this for me. Can you go with me? Let's go do this. It could be up here. Over and over and over again. Until we give in. And we say, oh, okay. All right, let's go. I'm going to do this now. All right, so Samson gets tired. He gets worn out. She rats him out. He gets caught. Now he's done for. Samson was powerless over his lust for women. We are powerless, listen, over our thoughts, feelings, emotions, desires, lusts, wants, shortcomings, and sickness if we are trying to handle them on our own. If we are leaning on not only our own understanding, but our own strength, 
They're going to nag at us until we give in to them. Even though we know that they're part of our old self. They're not that what God would have for us. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, why do we why do we let them nag at us? Why do we why do we keep them up here? You know, I was talking about those reservations that we keep back here. Right? Those old feelings, those old thoughts, those old desires, those old lusts. We keep them back here because we're afraid, well, probably this ain't going to work out anyway, so I better keep her number. This ain't going to work out anyway, so, you know, I know if I go back home, I know where to pick up a bag of dope. I know where I can get some money off of so-and-so. We keep those back here. Because we haven't got to a point yet where we complete surrender of self. Not only the initial surrender, but the daily surrender. When those things come up here, we need to get rid of them before we put them back right here. <coughs> Reservations. Those old, right? Old thoughts, feelings, emotions, desires, lust, wants, and shortcomings. We have to get rid of them. When God points them out to us, we need to surrender them to him. Okay? So Samson told her what she wanted so that he could get what he wanted. This is our old way of thinking. This is how we used to do things. And this is not how we can do things moving forward. We need to be honest. Samson let his desires run his life and kill him. Again, you can read the whole story for yourself. It's in Judges chapter 16. It comes back to how we perceive ourselves. Those old reservations. We admit we are powerless over our problems and that our lives had become unmanageable. <coughs> In this list of problems that I wrote, it doesn't say substance here. Okay? Because we already know that part. When we refuse to admit our powerlessness, we are only deceiving ourselves. The lies we tell ourselves and others are familiar. I can stop at any time I want. I'm in control. This one won't hurt anything. And all the while, we are edging closer to disaster. Samson was one of Israel's judges. As a child, he had been dedicated to God. And God had gifted him with supernatural strength. But Samson had a lifelong weakness, the way he related to women. Samson was especially blinded to the dangers he faced in a relationship with Delilah. His enemies were paying her to discover the secret of his strength. Three times she begged Samson to tell her his secret. Each time she set him up and tried to hang him over, hand him over to, to the enemy. Three times Samson lied to her and was able to escape, but each time he got closer to telling her the truth. Finally, Samson revealed his secret and was taken captive and died a slave in the enemy's hands. Samson's real problem can be found in the lies he told himself. <clears throat> in the lies that he told himself. He thought he could control this. He could handle this. It's okay. I'll just tell her one more lie. I'll get what I want. <clears throat> it's okay. I can just... One more half pint, and I'll be okay. Hmm. Again, Samson's real problem came can be found in the lies he told himself. By not admitting his powerlessness, he remained blind to the obvious danger that his pride and desire for beautiful foreign women were leading him to in, what they were leading him into. This caused him to gradually inch his way towards the ultimate death or untimely death. We need to be careful not to fall into a similar trap as we learn to acknowledge our powerlessness over our addictive, compulsive tendencies daily. 
we will become more aware of behavior that will likely lead us to destruction. <coughs> it all comes back to being honest with ourselves. What do we do with those temptations when they come here? Do we get honest? Do we share with someone else? Do we get on our knees and, and ask God, please take them from us? Or do we entertain them? Do we keep them and put them in the back just so, you know, well, this don't work out. I can always do this. We have to be honest with ourselves. see the destructive desires being destructive, we can steer clear of them. Right? We're powerless. God is powerful. Ask Him to help you and see, to see the things that you are powerless over. And, help, and ask Him to help you be honest with yourself. Ask Him to help you manage the things that you can control and ask for the wisdom to know the difference. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this message. There's a lot to it. But the message is clear that we try to manage things on our own. We have yet to really admit then that we are powerless. We are trying to manage them on our own. It's step one. We haven't even started yet. Until we can be honest with ourselves. Dysfunctional relationships that we think might be fun. Still doing certain things that we know are wrong in their eyes. Because we think they might make us feel better for a moment. Or having those reservations still in the back of our mind because we failed so many times over and over again. So we we have backup plans. Help us, Lord, with our faith. Believe that as you point out these things to us, Lord, that we can be honest with ourselves, recognizing these behaviors, these thought patterns, these desires, these lusts for what they are. They need to be part of our past, not our future. So we come to you now, Father, praying, asking for forgiveness, which we can find in your Son, Christ Jesus, that we would believe in our hearts that he came and he lived and he died on the cross for our sins, that we too can die of our old self by accepting him into our hearts as our personal Savior, repenting of our past, not wanting to go back, Lord. We become new, and I thank you, Lord, for that. Father, I thank you, too, that now that we have this relationship, you will point out to us these old behaviors that to this point we might still think are okay. But you will show us, Lord, that they are harmful. So help us, Father, then to be honest with ourselves and seek the guidance from you and the strength to carry it out, to put those old things at your feet and put them behind us so that we can move forward. We can read about Samson and his dysfunctional life, but it really, it mirrors our own. Help us, help us, Lord, not to wait until it's time for us to take our last breath, but now, <coughs> now. We all have Delilahs in our lives. They might not be a person. They might be something else that draws us, something else that nags at us, that we want to give in to. We rationalize in our minds and we, we think about it so much. So help us, Father, to let go, to surrender ourselves to you, accepting your Son, Christ Jesus, into our heart and our personal Savior. So that you might pick us up out of that mess, step and, and, and stand us on firm foundation, Lord. Now steady us as we go. 
because we need you. We need to be steady. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.